good evening and welcome to a very special event. Please welcome the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee. <laughs> the New York Times had this to say about Siddharth's book. Of all the sciences, biology is the most lawless. Now we have become fluent enough in its language, not only to understand what laws there are, but also to draft new ones. It is a familiar narrative with a big difference. Thanks to Dr. Mukherjee's remarkably clear and compelling prose, the reader has a fighting chance of arriving at the story of today's genetic manipulations with an actual understanding of the immensely complicated science and the even more complicated moral questions. The book opened at number one on the New York Times bestseller list and Sadhar's last book, The Emperor of All Maladies, was described by Time magazine as one of the most important books of the last century. And we'll also read from his brilliant new book, The Gene, An Intimate History. Please give them a big hand. A gene is, the, the definition of a gene is changing, um, like many things in science. But a gene is a unit of biological information. It mm -hmm. passes information, it carries information from cell to cell and from your parents to your offspring. Um, uh, one gene need not specify one trait, um, nor is it true that one, one trait can be specified by more than one gene. Just to give you two concrete examples, um, your eye um, is made is a genetic product. It is made by not one gene, there's no one, it's not like a blueprint such that there's a widget in your body that says make an eye, but multiple genes interact with each other to ultimately create this organ called the eye. Um, and uh, so, so but, but they supply information, they carry biological information, and I talk a little bit about how that biological information, it gets carried and, and why it gets carried. So that's what a gene is. What's a genome? A genome is a collection of all your genes, every gene that you possess. Um, and I'll give you, and it's best visualized as, as, through, a meta, as through an analogy or a metaphor. Um, your genetic code, our genetic code, is written in just four alphabets, A, C, T, and G. Um, if it was actually written down, uh, we have three billion of those. Mm. Um, you have, I have, we all have three billion. Three billion that we inherit from one parent, three billion that we inherit from another parent. Um, and if it was actually written down, it would um, look, if let's say we published it as a book, it would be 66 full sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, so that's what it, the book would look like. Mm. So you'd be sitting in this room, if you imagine this room as a library, every wall of this room would be one of those volumes of the 66 um, sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And here's what's amazing about it. If you uh, were to go pick out volume set 16, volume 7, page 4, it would read like this. It would read A, C, T, G, G, C, C, T, G, 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 C, G, G, G. It would be totally inscrutable to you and me. That's what the code would look like. And yet, and here's the kicker, here's what's astonishing. That's the, in the entire genome. It has all your genes, all the stuff that is between genes, the, reg, the, the, the sequences that tell genes when to go on, when to shut off, when to turn on. And yet out of that in totally inscrutable ACTG, CCCTG, your first, em, your embryonic cell can build you and me. And it can build you with five fingers, and it can build me with five fingers, and yet it can also build you so that you look like the way you do, and, look, and I have differences between you and me. Mm. Um, when a change occurs between one such set and another such set, we call it a variation. Um, when a change occurs, and that change has a certain uh, biological characteristic, um, we call it a mutation. Let's talk about the double-edged sword. The double-edged sword is that this same technology allowed us to diagnose BRCA1 and prevent breast cancer in, in a woman, right? If we didn't have this kind of technology, Angelina Jolie is one mm -hmm. mega film star. There are tens of thousands of women around the world who are benefiting from the fact that they have been diagnosed um, with, uh, if they choose to be, 
with uh, having a BRCA1 variation, and they can have prophylactic treatments, which can range from taking a medicine, doing nothing, mm -hmm. taking a medicine, uh, having a prophylactic mastectomy, having a prophylactic oophorectomy, having intensive screening, et cetera, et cetera. And in principle, tens of thousands of invasive breast cancers are and can be prevented. We know this from clinical trials using this technology. There is a child who I've met recently. I mean, I do gene therapy. I'm a gene therapist. There's a child that um, um, is living. She's six years old. And some of you see me have seen the film that I did with Ken Burns. Um, she was one of the patient zeros of um, technologies that allow us to introduce into her immune cells a gene that specifically recognizes her cancer and thereby arm her immune cells to be able to now kill the cancer. And she now is in her sixth year of remission uh, with a kind of leukemia that she would have certainly died from six years ago. Okay? So let's not, on, we, let's not begin by saying that, you know, let's just identify what one edge of that sword is. Now, the second edge of that sword is the sword that's coming to us. Um, which is that there are two technologies that we need to understand, and they're very important that they're distinctive from each other. And we need to know these uh, technologies. Number one, particularly for India, is prenatal genetic diagnosis. Prenatal genetic diagnosis allows you to essentially take an embryo or an egg, uh, potentially even an egg, but certainly an embryo, biopsy that embryo. You can take one cell out of the embryo, and because of a miraculous property of, of embryos, you can pick out that one cell and you can essentially very soon sequence the entire active genome of the embryo. I'm saying active genome because there's a little caveat there. We don't need to worry about it for now, right now. Hmm. But you can sequence about several thousands of the genes in that incipient embryo. You can have 10 of them and you can decide to implant five or one or two. Right? So that's pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and that allows you to diagnose uh, genetically uh, what, is in, what is the content, the genetic content of the embryo. Okay? So I will now give you, so that, that's pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. I'll give you the second one, and we'll come back to the quandaries. The second thing, which happened five years ago, it's something that we weren't directly involved in, although this is technology I use every day in the lab, and it's important to understand the difference. Again, let's go back to the analogy of these 66 sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. What pre-implantation genetic diagnosis does is to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to take one of these sets, sequence the genome, and decide that this one set works for me, and I'm going to implant that one set as a child in, in, my, in my womb. Is everyone clear about that? Technically clear about that. All right. Five years ago, we discovered, actually Jennifer Doudna, Emmanuel Charpentier, two amazing female, female women scientists and a whole bunch of colleagues. There's a long history to this. It's all in the book. Um, quite disputed, by the way. Mm. Uh, uh, anyway, found a technology which does something different, which is that now there are technologies that allow us to take, again, that 66 sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica, go to volume 7 in set 16, erase one word, and switch it out for a different word. That's a different technology. That's called genetic surgery. It's called genetic, en this is called genomic engineering mm -hmm. or genetic surgery and several other words have been used for it. The word that's co commonly used you'll find in the newspaper is called CRISPR for a reason that is complicated, doesn't need to be told, but it's called CRISPR. So those are two different kinds of technology. I'll tell you why they're different. In a fundamental way, they're different because obviously the first allows us to subtract information from the human genetic lineage, right? You can say, I'm going to select this mm -hmm. one embryo, and by selecting this one embryo, I'm subtracting away from the human genetic lineage anything else that is not part of this lineage, right? So I'm going to subtract away a child that might have a BRCA1 mutation. Mm -hmm. That's a subtractive quality. The second is adding information to the human embryo. Right? So now you can erase something, even though you're erasing it, you're fundamentally changing. And in fact, not only now you can erase, you can actually change the words themselves. You can go inside, change the word ACTG, erase it out, and switch it to AGGG. Okay? 
So those are the two technologies. We need to be aware of them. Mm -hmm. One is a subtractive technology, one is an additive technology. But the bottom line is that now the human genome, additive and subtractively, has become manipulable. We can now manipulate the human genome. Now come the ethical quandaries mm. or some of the moral quandaries. Let's say I have, and this is a question open to you, let's say I will, I find that in pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, I find a gene that causes a 100% chance of having, it's a highly penetrant mutation, causes extraordinary suffering. Let's say it causes a terrifying neurodegenerative disease. We know people like this. 100% likelihood that you will have a ne terrible neuro neurodegenerative disease. You have the chance of implanting or not implanting that child. What would you do? Not implant. Not implant the child. Some people would disagree. It depends on your personal conceptions of what you mean, what life is, choices, etc. Some people would disagree. Okay. Now let's switch out the paradigms a little bit. Now I say there's a 10% chance of um, having a child with a neurodegenerative disease. What would you do? I would still not implant. So, and now comes the arena, which is becoming going to be part of your world. What if I said that there was a 20% child in a society, in a deeply repressive society, of that child having a particular sexual orientation? What would you do? I'd implant. Deeply repressive society. That's not so, suffering. And that's the difference. That's so your, sexual orientation. So your understanding of suffering and my understanding of suffering is different. And these are questions that are not going to go away. These are questions that are coming in your direction tomorrow. And, and the numbers are going to be like this. The numbers are not going to be you know, 100% chance of having this, 0% chances of having this, they will be report cards made out of probabilities. There's that famous film, Gattaca, which some of you may have watched. Um, even Gattaca is becoming old in some ways. We are entering an era of personalized eugenic management. We will enter, we have already entered an era of personalized genomic management. Um, which is no different in some moral sense. It's not extermination. The, the comparison to, you know, to, to Nazi Germany is, is a comparison that can only be made to a certain extent. But the reality of personalized genomic man, uh, management is a reality that is coming to you. And unless you know the vocabulary, unless you know some sense of what the choices you're willing to make, unless you know, understand what your own sense of suffering is. Whose suffering is? Is your suffering the same as my suffering? Is my uh, projected suffering for a child that I have not yet had the same as my suffering uh, as I feel myself? Some people would say yes, some people would say no. But, um, and I vastly prefer the term sexual orientation because it does not have uh, the hard categories. The hard categories were. also the values attached to, of you course. know, homo, hetero, blah, 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 blah. It's, right. it seems to be, so sexual orientation is a much more, I think it's a neutral term, and it, it, it's a descriptive term. Um, but so what do we know? Well, we know something's important. We, we know some important things uh, in terms of uh, science. What do we know? We know, number one, is that if you have identical twins, um, the concordance, and by the word concordance, that means that the chances that they will share the same sexual orientation is vastly higher than random chance. What does that mean? Identical twins have, remember, identical genomes. They also share identical fetal environments. So, um, so identical twins in identical fetal environments have a vastly higher concordance of having the same sexual orientation. We'll talk about what those numbers are in a second. Fraternal twins who share the same fetal in microenvironment have a much lower uh, concordance of having the same sexual orientation. What does that tell us? That tells us that if you were to take those two things apart, the, the, the genetic component of it seems to be much stronger. Mm. Now, how strong is it? It's on the order of 40 percent, 50 percent. Those are the numbers, which would put it several fold higher than a average uh, numbers. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us also that there is clearly a strong biological basis for sexual orientation. There's no denying it. You can't wish those experiments away. Those are experiments that were conducted. Um, 
The number is not 100%. We don't know why that number is not 100%. Uh, that may be because, uh, again, because of uh, wide variations in preference, um, so that one person identifies mm -hmm. as homosexual and the other person does not identify as homosexual. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of how you self-identify. We know that that's a reasonable hypothesis because most countries have, have had repressive uh, uh, atmospheres and ambiances, so it's not difficult to imagine that one person may will not wish to identify. That's one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is that there is some element of random chance. There is some element, there are triggers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an environmental role. Maybe there is a behavioral role. We just don't know the answer. But the numbers are the numbers, and they will remain the numbers for a while unless we have other studies that dispute or change them. So, and that's why I said to, you know, we, it is obviously my preference, and I think it's the correct preference not to criminalize biology, um, and we should stop criminalizing biology. We actually talked a little bit about this, I'll just formalize some of it. Until recently, three unspoken principles have guided the arena of genetic diagnosis and intervention. First, diagnostic tests have been restricted to gene variants that are singularly highly, singularly powerful determinants of illness, that is, highly penetrant mutations. We talked of the idea that if you have the, if you have the mutation, if you have the variation, you will have the illness. And so the example of this could be Down syndrome, cystic fibrosis, or Tay-Sachs disease. Second, the diseases caused by these mutations have generally involved extraordinary suffering or fundamental incompatibilities with normal life. And third, justifiable interventions, such as the decision to abort a child with Down syndrome or to intervene surgically on a woman with BRCA1 mutation, have been defined through social and medical consensus, and all interventions have been governed by freedom of choice. So that's the three, I call it the triangle, um, uh, the justifiable triangle. So extraordinary suffering, very penetrant mutation, and a certain freedom of justifiable choice. Um, the three sides of these triangles can be envisioned as moral lines that most cultures up till now have been unwilling to transgress. Just to give you an example, the abortion of an embryo carrying a gene with, say, only a 10% chance of developing cancer in the future mm -hmm. violates the injunction against intervening on low penetrance mutations. Similarly, a state-mandated medical procedure on a genetically ill person without the subject's consent or parental consent in the case of a fetus crosses the boundary of freedom and non-coercion. Everyone here with me? Mm. Yet it can hardly escape our attention that these parameters are inherently susceptible to the logic of self-reinforcement. Self we determine the definition of extraordinary suffering. We demarcate the boundaries of normalcy versus abnormalcy. We make the medical choices to intervene. We determine the nature of what is justifiable and non-justifiable interventions. Human beings endowed with certain genomes are responsible for, responsible for defining the criteria to define, intervene, or even eliminate other human beings endowed with other kinds of genomes. Choice, mm. in short, seems like an illusion devised by genes to propagate the selection of similar genes? That's a tough question. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, in the late 1990s, a gene called 5-HTTLRP, which was found to encode a molecule that modulates signaling between certain neurons in the brain, was found to associate it with a response to psychic stress. The gene comes in two forms or alleles, a long variant and a short variant. The short variant is called HTT, I'll call it HT short. It's carried by about 40% of the population and seems to produce significantly lower levels of the protein. This short variant, 5-HT short, has been repeatedly associated with anxious behavior, depression, trauma, alcoholism, and high-risk behaviors. The link is not strong, but it's broad. The short allele has been associated with Increased suicidal risk among German alcoholics, increased depression in American college students, and higher rates of PTSD among deployed soldiers. So there are basically two gene variants, a short variant which causes a higher level of psychic stress, a long variant that causes a lower level of psychic mm -hmm. stress. Okay. 
In 2010, a team of researchers launched a research study called the Strong African Americans Family Project in which uh, basically what happened is that 600 American, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, 600 African American children, were uh, early adolescent children, were recruited for the study. The families were randomly assigned to two groups. In one group, the children received, and their parents received seven weeks of intensive education, counseling, emotional support, and structured social interventions focused on preventing alcoholism, binge behaviors, violence, impulsiveness, and drug use. And in the control group, the families received no interventions or minimal interventions. And at the same time, children in both these groups had this gene sequence, this gene that increases or decreases the risk of psychic stress. Everyone with me so far? Okay. The first result of this randomized trial was predictable from prior studies in the control group. Children with this short variant, that is the high risk, the psych psychic risk form of the gene, were twice as likely to veer towards high risk behaviors, including binge drinking, drug use, and sexual promiscuity as adolescents, confirming earlier studies that had suggested an increasing risk within this subgroup. Now, the second result is much more provocative because these very children, the ones that are at the highest risk, the ones that have this high risk variant, were the most likely to respond to social interventions. In the intervention group, children with the high risk allele were the most rapidly normalized, in quotes, that is, the most drastically affected subjects were also the best responders. It is as if resilience itself has a genetic core. Some humans are born resilient, but are less responsive to intervention, while others are born sensitive, but more likely to respond to changes in their environment. The idea of a resilience gene has entranced social engineers, and so writing in the New York Times in 2014, the behavioral psychologist Dave Belsky argued, should we seek to identify the most susceptible children and disproportionately target them when it comes to investing very scarce intervention and service dollars? This is Jay Belsky continuing. I believe the answer is yes. Some children are, I'm quoting, like delicate orchids. They quickly wither if exposed to stress and deprivation, but blossom if they're given a lot of care and support. Others are more, and again quoting, like dandelions. They produce, they prove more resilient to the effects of, negative effects of adversity, but at the same time, don't particularly benefit from, uh, uh, from positive experiences. And he writes, one might have even imagined a day when we could genotype all children in an elementary school to ensure that those who would benefit the most get help from the best teachers. So genotyping children in elementary school, foster care choices driven by genetic profiling, dandelions and orchids. Evidently, the conversation around genes and predilections has already slipped past the original boundaries of high penetrance genes, extraordinary sufferings and justifiable intervention to genotype-driven social engineering. So here are the questions. What if genotyping identifies a child with a future risk for unipolar depression or bipolar disease or schizophrenia? What about gene profiling for violence or criminality? or impulsivity? What constitutes extraordinary suffering? What justice interventions are justifiable and what is normal? Are parents allowed to choose normalcy for their children? What if obeying some kind of Heisenbergian principle of psychology, the very act of intervention reinforces the identity of abnormalcy? So people who have the book, this is from page 198. A memory, it's 1978 or 1979 and I'm about eight, eight or nine. My father has returned from a business trip and his bags are still in the car and a glass of ice water is sweating on a tray in the dining room table. It's one of those blistering afternoons in Delhi when the ceiling fans seem to slosh heat around the room, making it feel even warmer. Two of our neighbors are waiting for him in the living room and the air seems tense with anxiety, although I'm not sure I can discern why. My father enters the living room and the men talk to him for a few minutes. It is. I sense not a pleasant conversation. Their voices rise and their words sharpen, and I can make out the contours of most of the sentences even through the concrete walls of the adjacent room where I'm supposed to be doing homework. Jogu, my uncle, has borrowed money from them, not large sums, but enough to bring them to our house demanding repayment. He has told one of the men that he needs cash for medicines, although he's never been prescribed any, 
and the other man that he needs to buy a train ticket to go visit his older brothers. There's no such trip that's been planned. You should learn to control him, says one of the men, accusingly. My father listens silently and patiently, but I can feel the fiery meniscus of rage rising in him, coating his throat with bile. He walks to the steel closet where we keep the household cash and brings it to the men, making it a point of not bothering to count the notes. Um, he can spare a few extra rupees. They should just keep the change. By the time the men leave, I know there will be a bruising altercation at home. With the instinctual certainty of wild animals that run uphill before tsunamis, our cook has left the kitchen to summon my grandmother. The tension between my father and Jogu has been building for a while. His behavior at home, Jogu's behavior at home, has been particularly disruptive in these last few weeks, and this episode seems to have pushed my father over some edge. He walks into Jogu's room and yanks him bodily off the bed, and Jogu wails desertly like a child who's being punished for a transgression he doesn't understand. My father is livid, growing with, glowing with anger and dangerous. He shoves Jogu across the room. It's an inconceivable act of violence for him. He's never lifted a finger at home. My sister runs upstairs to hide. My mother is in the kitchen crying, and I watch the scene rise to its ugly crescendo from behind the living room curtains as if, to, as if watching a film in slow motion. And then my grandmother emerges from the room, glowering like a she-wolf. She is screaming at my father, doubling down on his violence. Her eyes are alight like coals, and her tongue is forked with fire. Don't you dare touch him. Get out, she urges Jogu, who retreats quickly behind her. I have never seen her more formidable. Her Bengali furls backward like a fuse towards its village origins, and I can make out some of the words thick with accent and idiom, sent out like airborne missiles. Womb, wash, taint. When I piece the sentence together, its poison is remarkable. If you hit him, she says, I will wash my womb with water to clean your taint. I will wash my womb. My, fa my father is also frothing with tears now. His head hangs heavily, and he's infinitely tired. Wash it, he says under his breath. Wash it, clean it, wash it. Thank you.